Hey everybody, John here, and today I will be presenting a new installment in our Learning Optimal Control with Dymo series. Today we'll be talking about the Supersonic Interceptor Minimum Time to Climb problem. If you watched our last one in the series, the Percristochrone, this one might be more exciting. This one's about an aircraft flying, also it's about a supersonic aircraft flying. The other one was about a bead and the optimal path for this bead to take. This one's about the optimal path for an aircraft to take to get up to 20,000 meters altitude going Mach 1. This is kind of fun. Before we talk about it, think in your mind, what's the best way to get up to Mach 1 in 20,000 meters? You could take off and climb at a constant rate and hit 20,000 meters in Mach 1 after accelerating as well. You could maybe go up to a certain altitude, be level in flight, accelerate, and then shoot up to 20,000 meters. There are lots of different options. We will use a collocation scheme and Dymos to solve this optimal trajectory problem. I have a few main goals of this video. One is to kind of motivate the use of co-location schemes for problems like these. If you're using a shooting method, you might run into discontinuities in the actual physics of the problem. For instance, if you're flying straight up or straight down, uh, a shooting method might fail there. This is because there are singularities in the actual equations of motion for flight. Now, when I say that shooting methods are susceptible to singularities, that does not mean that co-location methods are not. I simply mean that we have more control over the state in co-location methods and we're able to avoid regions and the dynamics where bad things happen. Let me give an example of that. If we have an explicit shooting method and we try a control history that happens to take the vehicle to an altitude of maybe negative 1,000 meters, then the atmospheric model might not be valid there and return NANDs or something like that. And that's just a real simple example if we give a control profile to a shooting method where we eventually get into a bad region, the shooting method doesn't know how to avoid it or what to do with that. The co-location method, on the other hand, because it has direct control over the states, would be able to move away from some of these regions. This is because we are representing both the physics of the problem and the controls of the problem simultaneously. We compare the results between each one of them and make sure that they make sense. I'll get more into that later. Just know from a high level that this min time to climb problem is a great example of why to use co-location schemes. There's also a fun little bit of lore here. The researcher who is looking at solving this minimum time to climb problem using co-location schemes, Bryson, supposedly, and again this is a rumor, maybe wanted to have the Air Force actually try it out with a real aircraft. You know, Bryson was doing all these simulations and pen and paper exercises to understand what's the best way to get up to a certain altitude and a certain speed. And the Air Force says, okay, but we currently do this in a certain way and we'll keep doing it this certain way. And this is where the rumor kind of comes in. Apparently Bryson went to a bar near a military base and maybe talked with some of the pilots and said, hey, I've got this idea for how you can get to a certain altitude and speed sooner than you would otherwise. Here are kind of the waypoints, the coordinates. Here's what you do. You accelerate, you decelerate, you climb according to this profile. And I'm just picturing some Tom Cruise looking people at the at the bar saying, well, okay, okay, I'll give this a shot. And supposedly, again, rumor goes that they did and then the Air Force started to listen. Maybe take that with a grain of salt. Maybe just say, hey, that's kind of a fun story. Let's get into the details of what I'm talking about here. So we'll be talking about the minimum time to climb problem and kind of a simplified setup here. The Dymos docs go through this in great detail. This min time to climb problem comes from chapter four of Bryson's book. So here we have the forces acting on the actual aircraft. We have the notion of lift, gravity, drag, thrust, and then also the velocity vector. H here is the actual altitude of the aircraft and R is kind of the range or distance of the aircraft. Just think X, Y position. We then have equations that describe the actual motion of the vehicle dynamics. I will not read these out. I will not belabor them, but just know it comes from a force balance of this. And also know that the actual equations that we use here are known as the two degrees of freedom or two DOF equations of motion. This means that we have a notion of alpha, which is the angle of attack, and gamma, the flight path angle. This means that the aircraft's position and relative kind of heading in space comes into play. We have some initial conditions. You're going to start at zero meters range or distance. You're going to start at 100 meters altitude, so it's just after takeoff. We're going a certain speed right after takeoff, which makes sense, and our flight path heading is zero degrees to start. We also have a mass, and in this case, it generally corresponds to the mass of an F-4 Phantom, which is the original aircraft used in these minimum time to climb problems. And like I mentioned before, our final conditions here are getting up to 20,000 meters altitude, Mach 1.0, and a flight path angle of zero degrees. So you wanna be in level flight. So we talked about the actual physics of the problem, the equations of motion and what these look like. Let's talk about what we do to get this into Dymos. First, we need to take these equations and describe them in an ODE system so that Dymos can understand what's going on here. Within this actual ODE group, we have a few different systems that come together, a few different subgroups and subsystems. The first such subsystem is the atmospheric model. We need to have some notion of the density of air and other properties coming from the atmosphere. 
This all stems from at different altitudes in flight, you might have different forces acting on the aircraft. Then we have a relatively simple aerodynamics group here. We could go into the details here, but just know we have a real simple kind of empirical aerodynamics formulation that we're using for this specific problem. Additionally, we have a very simplified propulsion group here, this prop group here. It takes in altitude here, which is H, ISP, which is the specific impulse, and throttle, which is the notion of, you know, zero to one, how much throttle the propulsion system is seeing. We then have this last kind of subsystem here, the flight dynamics subsystem. This is where we have those two DOF equations of motion. Remember what I showed you up here, where we have the notion of thrust and drag and this balance on the actual aircraft. That is where those actual equations of motion come into play within DIMOS. So all that being said, that's just our ODE system. Next up, let's talk about building and running this actual design problem. We first import a lot of the normal things for OpenMDO and DIMOS. We set up a driver. In this case, we're able to use SLSQP. Then we instantiate a trajectory. This trajectory is where we will add a phase using the minimum time to climb ODE. We also have some notion of a transcription here where we have a gauss lobato transcription, which is just how we choose to discretize this space. We add the phase and add this trajectory to the entire model. Again, all of this, not revolutionary so far. We're really just setting up the actual DIMOS model. Let's talk about now how we choose to add the states to this problem. So we now say, hey, we have this phase object. We need to set the time options, states, and controls. We haven't explicitly discussed what these states and controls will be, so let's do that now. First of all, we have time, literally time, like seconds, but we also have, in this case, five states. We have R, which is again for range or distance, the actual X position of the aircraft. We have H, which is altitude or the Y position of the aircraft. Then we also have V, which is the velocity of the aircraft, the current kind of true airspeed velocity or TAS for it. We also have gamma, which is the flight path angle. And last up, we have M, which stands for mass. As we burn fuel, we will get lighter for this trajectory. Makes sense, right? So those are our five states, but we also have a control here. In this case, based on our parameterization, our control is alpha. What this means is that we're allowing the optimizer to control alpha, the angle of attack, throughout the flight. This means that the optimizer can choose, you know, which angle of attack to have the aircraft at to try to meet this, this minimum time to climb problem. Now you might've noticed we don't really have a notion of throttle. This is because if we were piloting this aircraft for a, a normal mission, we'd have to throttle down for crews and throttle down to idle for descent. But for minimum time to climb, we're gonna be full throttle the whole time. We're just blazing ahead, we're at full throttle. And so there is no notion of a throttle control. Do know that in general for other aircraft trajectory optimization applications, you probably would have a throttle control or some notion of not always being at full throttle. You don't think Goose and Maverick wouldn't be at full throttle if they're trying to get the minimum time to climb. That's why throttle is assumed to be 1.0 this entire time. And we see that represented here as we have these phase dot add parameter calls. Here we have that throttle is 1.0, opt equals false. So the optimizer is not changing it. We have S here, which stands for the area of the wings. Again, this is just used in our simple aerodynamics model to convert from CL and CD, coefficients of lift and drag into actual lift and drag forces. Then we have the specific impulse here. Again, that's just a notion of the propulsion group, right? The actual performance of the propulsion system. Now let's keep on going down this file. We have a few boundary constraints that we add to the phase. These are really just capturing what we had up here. What we had right here are the initial conditions and the final conditions. And the boundary constraints that we have are all about those final conditions. So we have the altitude here, we're setting it at 20,000 meters. We have the Mach, we're setting it to one. And we have the flight path angle or gamma, which we're setting to zero. In DIMOS, you're able to set boundary constraints either at the initial or final locations. What this means is that during the actual flight, these constraints do not come into play. It's only at the beginning, or in this case, the final points that these constraints come into play. Now, if you want something to be constrained throughout the entire path of the flight, you can add what's known as a path constraint. We have two path constraints in this case. We have the first, which is the altitude. We say the lower is 100 meters and the upper is 20,000 meters. We're not allowing the aircraft to go above 20,000 meters, or go below 100 meters while it's trying to get to 20,000 meters. So far, this makes sense. We also have a mock path constraint here. Here we have a lower of 0.1, so we can't go slower than 0.1, which also wouldn't make sense for a min time to climb problem, but we have an upper of 1.8. These mock constraints really just keep us at a reasonable area of the flight envelope. Lastly, in terms of the actual optimization problem formulation, we have an objective. And now I keep saying minimum time to climb. Yeah, in this case, our objective is time. We're trying to minimize the final value of time here. So what this means is that we need to satisfy all of these constraints, these three boundary and two path constraints, while trying to minimize the length of time for this flight. We had a direct solver here on the model so that we can get the correct derivative information for this optimization problem. And then we actually set up the model. 
After that, we have a few initial guesses that we provide. What this means is that we have an initial value for time and a duration for time. We say 500 seconds. Is that the fastest we can go? I don't know. I'll just guess 500 seconds. Then for each of the states and the control of alpha, we also have initial guesses. The initial idea for distance is that we go from 0 to 50,000 meters, and for altitude is that we go from 100 to 20,000 meters. Additionally, we have a velocity guess. We know that we must end at Mach 1. We start with a certain velocity as well. For gamma, we know we start at level, and we also want to end at level, but in between will, by definition, not be level if we're climbing. And then lastly, for mass, we have some just notion of how much actual fuel will burn. Maybe we start at 19,000 kilos and we'll go down to 10,000 kilograms. I don't really have a good idea for just an off the top of my head guess for how much fuel we will burn. But luckily, mass is a relatively easy state for the optimizer to handle. Lastly, here we have a guess for the controls. We just say eh, it's zero to start for alpha, but we know that the optimizer will change this to different values. Then after setting all of this up, we have a Dymos run problem call here. We get some fun output. It shows us the constraint report. It shows us the three boundary constraints that we have, the two path constraints that we have. It's got a few more checks here, just from OpenMDO and Dymos coming together to make sure that everything is looking good. We have derivative coloring information, which saves us some time during the actual optimization. And then we have the report here. Let me bop over to a, a version of this notebook that I have open here, and we can look at the final results. So this is fantastic. Let's talk about this. These are the final results that we have, the optimal results, for the flight profile for this minimum time to climb problem. On the top, we have the altitude versus time plot, and on the bottom, we have the alpha or control, the angle of attack versus time plot. So let's go through this in more detail. We start at a low altitude and we accelerate, and then we climb a little bit, and then we kind of actually dip and level out. And then at the very end of this flight profile, we zoom up to 20,000 meters. We look at the uh, angle of attack here and we say, okay, it's kind of looks like this. And then it's pretty even here as we're accelerating. And then it just drops off at the very end as we shoot up to 20,000 meters and then level out. I think we should dig into this more together and look at some more different graphs of this. So first on the left-hand side, we have exactly what I just showed you. We have altitude and angle of attack, but we have one additional plot that I want to talk about. When I'm showing you these plots, the dots or points come from the collocation method. This is where we are actually sampling the physics of the problem by looking at these equations of motion and evaluating them at each one of these points. The through line here comes from an explicit simulation. This would be like a conventional shooting method. What we do with this through line is make sure that it goes through all of the points and we make sure that the physics that the collocation scheme is dealing with are the same that actually would happen when we use this shooting method or the simulation method. This is also known as the implicit solution in the dots and the explicit history in the lines. Now let's move on to this right hand side here. This right hand side here is a very interesting plot and it might take a little bit to kind of look at and understand it. On the x axis we have airspeed, in this case meters per second, and on the y axis we have altitude, in this case in meters. We start out right here near the bottom left hand side and we want to end up at Mach 1 in 20,000 meters up here. You could fly directly from here to here, but that's not the optimal path. This is showing the optimal path here. Looking at this contour plot, we also have these colors, and these show essentially the notion of energy. You have a low energetic state in the bottom left-hand corner, and in the upper right-hand corner, you have a highly energetic state. You would either be going very fast in terms of airspeed, or you would be at a high altitude. You can think of this in those classical kind of physics one days of having high potential energy or high kinetic energy. The reason why I bring this up is that you can see the trajectory go from a state of low energy, increasing its airspeed while staying at a lower altitude, and then shooting up in altitude and actually going a little bit slower here. Then we kind of move across these energy contours and increase speed again while dipping down. And then as we dip down in altitude, we're building up speed. We go from 300 to 400 meters per second and we zip on over. We keep accelerating right here and that's this part right here where we're not actually going up in altitude too, too much. We're going up just a little bit, but we're really focusing on accelerating. At this far end, we're going over 500 meters per second. And that's closer to that Mach 1.8 upper limit than to the Mach 1.0 that we need to be at. And so now that we're going this fast, now that we're going above this Mach 1.5 side of things, we shoot over and we slow down while going up in altitude. Now this is kind of fun to think about. Look at the colors of the, of the actual contour plot behind here. When we go from here to here, although it's a far distance in terms of altitude, it's not that far in terms of the energy contours. We see here that it's actually within the same band of this energy contour. We're just building up a little bit more energy to get up to there. I think this is a really powerful plot to kind of see the trade-off between potential and kinetic energy for this problem. Now, I got a little bit into the details of the physicality of the problem 
but I don't necessarily want that to be the main focus here. Really, my main goal here is to show you how to formulate and pose and solve a complex aircraft trajectory design problem within Dimos. Across the way, we had a few good little nuggets of information. One is the notion of using a co-location scheme instead of explicit shooting and what we gain from that. Again, in this case, the equations of motion are singular. If we're flying straight up or straight down, that could be a problem. In this case, you might think, well, hey, if I'm trying to climb in the minimum time, maybe there's a point where I will be going straight up. And that's where an explicit shooting approach would fail. Luckily, these co-location schemes do not suffer. They're able to solve complex problems like this, even if there would be singularities in some of the equations of motion in some cases, because the actual motion of the vehicle is decoupled from the control history. We enforce them being coupled at the optimizer level. Let's talk more about that, actually. I want to go into detail about that. So here I have something actually from my PhD dissertation days. Oh, and in this animated example, I'm using an aircraft that is not the exact same as the F4. So some of the results in the static images and some of the results in this animated one may not match. I was instead using the efficient supersonic air vehicle or ESAV vehicle. You don't need to think too hard about it, but just understand that's why there might be some differences in these different minimum time to climb problems that I'm showing you. These are the initial guesses that we have for the altitude in this case, in kilometers, just remember we're going up to 20,000 meters, and the time. This is our initial guess profile. It's just a straight line. It goes from zero to 20. And we have the initial guess for the rates for this altitude with respect to time as well. So think about each one of these points as the co-location points and the lines that go through them as the derivatives for the actual motion at these points in time and space. Again, I'm showing you the zeroth iteration of the optimizer here. So it's just the initial guesses but I want to hit play here and we can see how the optimizer moves this aircraft trajectory such that the physics of the problem are well represented and it's the actual optimal minimum time to climb. This is great. In the beginning, we had this straight line and we saw that the ODE rates were not matching up. We saw that these derivatives of the lines were not matching up. My colleague Rob has a great analogy here. It's the notion of co-location schemes being a piece of cooked spaghetti. So you got a little piece of noodle here that you plop down on a graph and you move that spaghetti around until it meets the actual equations of motion, until it meets the actual physics of the problem. For the notion of the co-location schemes, we need to evaluate the rates of the ODE at each of those points and make sure that it matches the rates for the interpolative polynomial or spaghetti that we're using in this case. In the beginning here, these rates do not match the actual spaghetti. Here we just lay down the spaghetti in a straight line and hey, it's not right. We hit play and move forward and the optimizer is trying out a few different things. It's trying to meet the feasibility of this problem. It's trying to say, hey, I want to put down this path and I want to make sure that the rates match the actual physics of the problem. Here they're not yet, but over time, and these are through different iterations of the optimizer, it gets closer and closer. You can see here that about 20 seconds onward, it's looking better. It's still not quite right in the beginning, but we'll get there. And then eventually it brings on down. And now we have what appears to be a reasonable trajectory. We have these rates and they match the interpolative rates given by the polynomial that we're using to represent the trajectory. It's just not optimal. So you can think of this as a feasible trajectory for right now, but we want to focus on optimality now. The optimizer is trying to focus on optimality and feasibility simultaneously. Without getting into the math details of it all, feasibility is usually reached first and then optimality is solved for. We now have just over 300 seconds to perform the mission, but is this the minimum time? Uh, no. We let the optimizer go a little bit longer and take a look at this. This is beautiful. The computed state rates are matching the interpolative polynomial rates. This is a nice solution. The optimizer says, hey, this is feasible and optimal in this case. Isn't that great? I want to use this supersonic min time to climb problem as the first example of an aircraft trajectory optimization that we'll be showing in this series. If you're able, please check out the doc page that goes into more detail about this, but I'll also highlight a few others that are relevant to the conversations we had today. One more is about optimal control transcriptions and what this means. This goes into more detail about co-location and explicit shooting, what's similar and what's not. This is a really powerful kind of doc page that if you're familiar with shooting methods, might help you understand more about co-location schemes and why they're useful. In the same vein, you might have guessed the page, what is co-location, is also useful. Rob did a fantastic job going into more detail here about what the heck is going on behind the scenes, why we use a polynomial to represent these physics, what it looks like to have different rates, and how these rates and points are used in time and space. This is a really nice doc page. So thank you for watching this. I hope that you gained some insight into how to solve aircraft trajectory optimization problems using Dymos. 
why it makes sense to use collocation schemes over other methods, especially for certain types of problems, and how we can understand and kind of interpret actual results that we get out of these optimal trajectory problems. Maybe next time you're casually talking to an Air Force fighter pilot, you can let them know the optimal trajectory that you find in Dimos. Everybody, thanks for watching. Take care now. Bye.